Well, hello. Uh, my name is Glenn Keating. I am a uh, paramedic with Delaware County EMS. I'm a captain up there in charge of continuous quality improvement and outcomes. Uh, I also have my bachelor's in emergency medical care from Eastern Kentucky University. And I am also a registered respiratory therapist. And I practice occasionally at uh, Grant Medical Center in Columbus. So that's my, that's my background and uh, gives me uh, an opportunity to tie all those things together to talk to you about a, a unique concept called crisis oxygenation. Um, bottom line is uh, oxygen is something that we all need. Uh, some situations that people find themselves in require that they need more oxygen than maybe other people do. So we're going to get into kind of some of the why and the how. Uh, first, I thought we thought I would start with just a real brief anatomy and pathophysiology lesson. We all know that the, the lungs draw in air from the outside, ambient air into our lungs. And uh, what we need from that air is oxygen. So ambient air typically consists about 21% unless you're in some kind of uh, hostile air environment. Um, but uh, get 21% that oxygen gets into your lungs. And then from the lungs, the cardiovascular system pumps blood around and that blood carries the oxygen by way of the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin's a uh, part of the red blood cell. It has four different points that has uh, iron rich areas that attach onto the oxygen molecules and allow for it to be transported. It's the primary way that oxygen can be transported in the around the blood to the cells. Um, so not only does it do that, it also uh, helps bring back some CO2 back from the cells uh, to the uh, lungs where it gets blown off. Now, why are oxygen and, and CO2 important in this situation? Well, in order to, basically oxygen is needed by the cells in order to continue living. So millions of cells in your body requires a lot of oxygen molecules uh, and the, the lungs and the heart and the blood and the vascular system all work together to make sure that the cells get to that oxygen and are able to complete what's called the Krebs cycle. So kind of a quick breakdown of it. You know, glucose turns, uh, get, gets with oxygen and goes into the mitochondria. You get some byproducts of the carbon dioxide and some water. But what you really, what the cells really need is that uh, 36 of uh, adenosine triphosphate, or right, ATP. That is the fuel that the mitochondria really needs uh, in order to, to keep the cells alive. When oxygen isn't available, uh, it turn, the glucose goes into the cell and, and instead lactic acid is produced. So you have uh, one of two different things happening. You have either this, which is aerobic meta metabolism, and that's where all the systems work together well. Um, and oxygen gets into the cell, you get that 36 ATP, you get that carbon dioxide and water, um, and, and the cells remain alive. They remain happy. When something in that system, whether the lungs, the heart, the hemoglobin, the blood, the vascular system, or something wrong in the cell doesn't go well, uh, and no oxygen is available, then the cells start producing lactic acid, uh, just as it would produce the byproducts of, of carbon dioxide and, and water and would produce the ATP. The problem is without that ATP fuel and the production of the lactic acid, uh, the cells start to hurt and eventually are going to die unless some sort of uh, intervention takes place. Now, not a huge deal uh, in, little, in, in little sections, in, in, not a big deal in, in small doses. People often feel sore, uh, tired after a workout. Um, that's a buildup of lactic acid uh, when you're working out so hard that you don't have enough oxygen to, to fulfill the demands of the cells and the muscles. And so you get a little bit of a lactic acid buildup. But this is a very minute uh, amount. Um, what I want to talk today, though, is what happens when you have a, a large systemic failure. Um, and when I, when I mean large systemic failure, I mean one of the systems that we talked about, whether it be the heart and lungs or the blood or the vascular system is failing us and large numbers of cells, millions of cells aren't getting the oxygen they need, what exactly can happen? So one of two things happen, I'm sorry, to go back, um, you know, different from small isolated injuries, like I said, where maybe like you're working out, you get a little bit of lactic acid buildup, um, or you maybe have like a stroke where a small part of the brain or a heart attack or a small part of the heart isn't being perfused. Uh, what I'm talking about here is large 
areas of the of the body which aren't getting oxygen to meet the demand of the cells. So one of two things is going on that's that's causing this. So it could be either hypoxia or it could be shock. Now, if we read the definitions, hypoxia is a deficiency in the amount of oxygen reaching the tissues, where shock is a circulatory failure causing inadequate delivery to meet the cellular oxygen demands. Those are um, definitions pulled straight out of the dictionary, pretty much. Sound very familiar, though, right? So I think you could easily make the argument that uh, hypoxia and shock could almost be the same thing. And, and they are and they aren't, but for all intents and purposes, for what we're going to talk to talk about today, I'm going to try and make the argument that uh, we should be aggressive in our treatment of bad hypoxia as if it was a shock patient. Okay, so is shock always hypoxia? No. Is hypoxia always shock? No. But shock can be caused by hypoxia, and hypoxia left, left uh, untreated for a long time will lead to shock. Um, so these both happen as a result of large systemic failures, and they both have a point of no return, a point of uh, irreversible uh, damage. But if we uh, attend to it early, identify it, and treat it early, we're going to have a much better chance of that patient having recovering from that systemic failure. Time really is the main factor in this. So time is, is tissue in this. And so what I want to talk today is uh, about not only that uh, time where that patient's definitely in hypoxia or definitely in shock, but that state right before it. And that's what I'm calling for this presentation. I'm calling it crisis. So looking at a big abstract view of that, of this, as we go from left to right in this picture, we see that the blood has plenty of oxygen. You have 100% SpO2. You have plenty of physical blood. Uh, so the lungs, plenty, the lungs are working, there's plenty of blood, the heart's pumping everything around, that's why you have good cardiac output. But if one of those things is to fail, or several of those things is to fail, then we're going to start moving to the right. As time goes on, we're going to start losing that SpO2, we're going to start losing that blood, and we're going to eventually lose that cardiac output. And as we start getting closer to the right side of this graph, which you see, then you start entering a period of crisis. So what exactly, when do we know that our patient's in crisis and how do we assess for it? You can do some basic things as far as taking a good history, you look at visible signs of the patient, their skin, their, col their skin color, their tone, their, G their Glasgow coma scale, listen to their lung sounds. We can also use some of our instruments to determine what's going on. So uh, checking heart rate and SpO2, uh, getting an EKG if possible, checking their blood pressure, uh, evaluating their end CO2, and monitoring their temperature. Why we do all this is because we want to know where on this chart our patient is. So this is, there's, there's no science behind this chart. I just want to illustrate the picture of what happens. Um, the green line kind of that starts out at around 100 and then drops off, that's your SpO2 over time when you're in a, when a patient's in a systemic failure. Uh, and same thing with the blue line. The blue line is uh, your hydrogen ion content, so your uh, carbon dioxide and your lactic acid content in your blood. Uh, so we're here at this uh, zero mark. We're here at this zero mark. <clears throat> Numbers look pretty good. You're at 100% SpO2. Uh, your carbon dioxide is probably around 35, and you don't have a ton of lactic acid in you. But as, your, as the system goes into failure, for whatever reason, you're going to have significant increases. So the blue line obviously goes up, just like, just like a rocket ship. And your green line here, your SpO2 kind of goes down the hill, just like Mr. Ralph Wiggum here. So once those things take off, whether you're the rocket ship or you're Ralph Wiggum rolling down the hill, it's hard to slow that down, okay? Now let's pair that up with what it looks like when we map it out next to a, a typical EMS call. So something happens, there's an event, specific or more appropriately, a, a dispatch of an event. Somebody calls 911. That's at your zero mark there 
on that far left corner. Around two minutes to get en route, around six minutes or so to get on scene, and about another 30 seconds to get on the, on to be at the patient's side. As you can see with the way, I'm sorry, this is all drawn out. By the time we get to the patient, at no fault of our own, are we already kind of behind the eight ball. So when we <clears throat> are with patients that are in systemic failure of some kind, we need to make sure that we're aggressive with how to treat, treat it or else we're gonna have a very hard time and we could uh, eventually, it could lead to the patient's demise. Now, how do we know this is true? Well, let's talk about the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. What this curve shows is the amount of pressure at the bottom here, this is the amount of pressure of oxygen in the blood that is required to put oxygen and saturate oxygen in the hemoglobin. So your uh, oxygen saturation over here is on the left. Your partial pressure of oxygen is, is over here on the right. So if you don't have, so for example, on a normal healthy patient, we hope that the uh, partial pressure of oxygen or the PO2 with a patient on room air is about 6,200. And if you draw out the lines and forgive my uh, artwork here, but if you draw out the line straight up and then draw that across, a partial pressure of oxygen is about um, 80, 89, 90%. It's a pretty good number, actually. Um, it's, that's really good. Most people live usually between like 70 and 100. And so that's going to put you 90 plus every time. Now, when you get when there isn't enough oxygen in the lungs to diffuse into the blood for whatever reason, you're going to have issues getting uh, the high enough oxygen saturations and eventually the cells are going to suffer because of it. So, for example, if you had a PO2 down around 40, that lines up to here and gets you a sat about, uh, about 82, about 72, maybe between 72 and 74 percent. So boy, that was a that was a drastic change. We dropped our partial pressure of oxygen by 20 points. Up here, if you're at 100 and you drop your uh, if you're at 100 and you drop your partial pressure of oxygen 20 points, not a big deal. You've gone only just a few percentage points when you measure your O2 saturations. But if you drop 20 points and you're already low, you fall down a very steep curve. Okay. So it's, it's imperative that we're measuring these oxygen saturations because once we start getting low into the 80s, 70s, and 60s, you're gonna drop off unless there's some kind of intervention that takes place. Now, as you can see, there's a green line and a blue line that are also on there. And I wanna focus on the blue line because these uh, lines, this curve, can shift in certain situations. So the three ways that they can shift, uh, either increased temperature of the patient, increased 2,3 DPG, which is an enzyme in the blood, doesn't really have much applicability to uh, us in the pre-hospital setting, so you don't have to worry about that one. And uh, <clears throat> increased hydrogen ion content. And we said the biggest hydrogen ion content uh, factors in the blood are your carbon dioxide and the presence of lactic acid. So the more carbon dioxide and the more lactic acid in the blood, or the higher the temperature of the patient, the more we should expect a rightward shift. Now let's map out a, a right, this rightward shift here. So let's go back to that 60 number again, okay? Before we were about here with 60, and now let's map that up and across, and you're about 85. So same partial pressure of oxygen, small, or less saturation of hemoglobin. The problem is when you have uh, acidic conditions, higher, higher, higher hydrogen ion content conditions, or higher temperature, the hemoglobin doesn't want to pick up oxygen as readily. So the worse that those conditions are, the more your hemoglobin is going to struggle to pick up oxygen and eventually deliver it to the cells. So the cells are going to suffer because of issues related to temperature and related to acidity. So with that in mind, let's talk about what specifically crisis looks like. All right, so our first case here, I have a 25-year-old male, had some convulsions at work, post dictal upon EMS presentation, GCS of about six, but improving. The GCS was three per the bystanders. 
after uh, seizing for about six minutes of witness convulsions. So once you ask yourself, should we expect this patient to be in some sort of crisis? And what can we look at to tell us that? So a little uh, background, we're talking like grand mal seizures, okay? You have a lot of chaotic electrical signals in the, in the brain, the patient becomes unconscious, there's tons of unorganized muscle movements. But with that, you also have an extended period of disorganization amongst your respiratory muscles, your diaphragm, your intercostal muscles that operate the lungs. And then because of all that extra activity, you have increased temperature, increased heat generation in the muscles. So you have an increase in overall body temperature. So because of that decreased organized respiratory muscle activity, uh, your patient's going to struggle to ventilate. This can also be worsened by the drugs that we use to treat it, which is benzodiazepines. So that's your Versed, it's your Ativan, some places still carry um, uh, diazepam, um, the trade name is escaping me, but various uh, benzodiazepines that are used to treat the seizures. Very important step. We need to stop the seizure because if not, it could uh, fry muscle because the muscles could get too hot and it could fry and it can also fry your brain. Uh, important, prob important problem to try and solve. So we need to do that, but we need to be cognizant of also what these benzodiazepines are doing. So decreased respiratory muscle activity, uh, decreased respiratory drive sometimes because of benzodiazepines. So we're gonna lose uh, some oxygen and we're going to lead to increased PCO2 or partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood. So increased carbon dioxide means higher hydrogen ion content in the blood and decreased saturations. That's going to cause that rightward shift that we described earlier. Uh, and as um, less oxygen gets to the cells, there's gonna be increased lactic acid due lactic acid production, and uh, in addition to that, the increased temperature could also further that rightward shift on the oxyhemoglobin dose association curve. So, and then to tack on to that, they may have the inability to protect their own airway, which could lead them to aspirate and uh, cause additional problems uh, in the lungs. So, so with these patients, expect to see, especially when they're seizing, expect to see some erratic CO2 numbers, uh, just because there's that lack of organization of the respiratory muscles. Expect an increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, but also be on the lookout for decreased uh, SpO2s. So somebody after a grand mal seizure, are they in crisis? Yeah, I think they're pretty fragile and I think they should, uh, we should be addressing it. Um, there's a lack of oxygen to the cells because there's a lack of oxygen in the lungs. And then that right shift caused by the buildup of lactic acid and carbon dioxide is gonna prevent the hemoglobin from uptaking more oxygen if it's present in the cells. Furthermore, there's, because of the lack of respiratory muscle coordination, there's, a, there's an inability for the lungs to blow off CO2 effectively. And like I said, that's going to further increase your uh, carbon dioxide and lactic acid. Uh, your, it's going to increase your um, hydrogen ion content, both your carbon dioxide and your lactic acid. So what can we do about that? Well, early treatment should be that we are uh, very and prepared to provide ventilations to these patients as quickly as possible with oxygen while trying to stop the seizure. So three things in, that need to happen at the same time. We need to ventilate these patients, blow off that CO2. We need to give the patients lots of oxygen, not only for what they need currently, but for what they needed during the seizure. Uh, the oxygen demand was definitely not meeting the supply. So high likelihood that there's a lot of lactic acid and then we need to stop the seizure. So that way we're uh, saving the, the muscle tissue from the extreme temperatures of that, that activity and also preventing the brain from uh, suffering any kind of damage. So let's talk about our next case. It's a 64 year old female at an ECF, altered level of consciousness by the staff. Say that she's sluggish to respond, normally alert and oriented, no problems. She's at the ECF after a hip replacement has a Foley catheter with dark cloudy urine in it. So should we expect this patient to be in crisis? And what can we look at to tell us that? 
available. Well, what do we think this patient's having? Well, this patient's probably in sepsis, more specifically urosepsis. So not uncommon, uh, especially with Foley catheter placements for uh, bacteria to get inside the urinary tract and, and break in uh, multiplying and spreading. So bacteria from that infection spreads throughout the body. And the body's response to this is something called SIRS or systemic inflammatory response syndrome, which is kind of the step right before sepsis. The difference between SIRS and sepsis is with sepsis, we know the source. With SIRS, they have all the signs and symptoms, we just don't know the source. Regardless, the same things happen. Uh, with SIRS and sepsis, capillaries begin to leak fluid, and then also capillaries and larger blood vessels begin to dilate. With that, you have essentially decreased blood volume because you lose a lot of plasma, and you also have decreased blood pressure. The heart rate tries to increase to try and compensate, but sometimes it's, it's too little too late. Uh, but then also the body also, in response to the infection, uh, spikes a fever to try and fight off that infection. So given the decreased blood flow and the volume, you have a lot of anaerobic metabolism and lactic acid production at the level of the cells. And that's going to drive up your hydrogen ion con content. It's going to make you uh, make the patient more acidotic, as well as the increased temperature as a response to the bacterial infection. You're going to have that rightward shift again, where it's going to take a higher PO2 to try and get the saturations that we're looking for. This patient will probably present with a high respiratory rate and heart rate, normal to low blood pressures, uh, low end tidal CO2s, and probably with decreased uh, SpO2 as well. So do we think they're in crisis? Absolutely. So again, lack of uh, oxygen available to the cells, um, which causes a, a right shift, which is further hindering the body's ability to deliver cells or deliver oxygen to the cells. And that's because of that increased hydrogen ion content, specifically the lactic acid. The body in sepsis is going to try and compensate for that all that extra lactic acid by blowing off extra CO2, which is why you see the increased respiratory rate and the low end tidal CO2. Unfortunately, most of the time, especially in real bad sepsis, despite the body's best attempts to blow off CO2 and balance out uh, the acidity of the blood, it's not going to be enough. So you're still going to have that rightward shift because of that increased hydrogen ion content and acidity of the blood. So it's still going to be, we still need to flood these people with oxygen in order to get the saturations that the cells need to get them out of uh, anaerobic metabolism. And that's exactly what we need to do in our, in our treatment. Recognize that the patient's in sepsis, um, the increased heart rate, the fact that they just had surgery, they have a Foley catheter in that has some dark and cloudy urine. Uh, they're at an extended care facility, uh, blood pressure may or may not be affected, but all those things that I mentioned are key things that say, oh, and the fever, that say the patient's either in, in SIRS or sepsis. Again, difference between SIRS and sepsis. Sepsis, we know the, the source of the infection, SIRS, they have all the signs and symptoms, we just don't know the source. So we need to recognize, provide them oxygen, support their ventilation if needed. Breathing that fast for that long to try and compensate can become tiresome quickly, but they need to breathe that fast or else they risk uh, further worsening the acidity of their blood. You may have to protect their airway in, this, in these kind of cases. If it's necessary, it's not necessary uh, because we don't want them to aspirate, but also be careful. Like I said, the, the ventilation, their high respiratory rate is a compensatory mechanism. And if we knock them down and tube them and, and ventilate them at a normal rate and, and depth, then that may not be enough for what they, what they actually need to blow off the CO2 to try and compensate what's going on in their blood. Really, these patients also need uh, fluids or vasopressors. So fluids to replace the, the plasma and the fluid that's been lost from the leaky capillaries, but then also vasopressors to get those uh, blood vessels back to a, a good tone so that they can actually have a, a decent blood pressure to where blood can be distributed throughout the body, uh, especially to those, to those cells that are in anaerobic metabolism and are uh, releasing lactic acid. Long term, they need antibiotics. Uh, the sooner we can get antibiotics to them, the better. Uh, so rapid transport to a, to a hospital so that way they can get antibiotics. Um, most places will start out with a, with a broad spectrum antibiotic to just try and cover as many 
pathogens as possible and then try and figure out where what type of uh, bacteria is actually causing the issue and go to a more narrow spectrum from there. So that's a quick overview of uh, treatment for urosepsis. Let's keep talking. So case number three is a 72 year old male, uh, difficulty breathing, audible crackles. He's in the tripod position at home, pale and diaphoretic skin, been out of his heart medications for three days. So do we expect, should we expect this patient to be in crisis and what can we look at to tell us? This case, most likely a congestive heart failure type case, uh, the wet sounding lungs, the pale diaphoretic skin. What's happening is, you know, he, this person has limited heart function and so fluid backs up into the lungs uh, from the heart that's overworked by too much fluid. With that fluid being in the lungs, it decreases the diffusion of CO2 that's trying to get out of the bloodstream and into the air. And it's also inhibiting the uh, flow of oxygen that's trying to get from the lungs into the bloodstream. So with that, decrease in oxygen is leading to lactic acid production. The, inhib the CO2 being inhibited from leaving the venous blood uh, increases the CO2 in the arterial blood. So with that, lactic acid build up of lactic build up of lactic acid build up of carbon dioxide uh we're gonna have it's it's gonna lead to issues so with these patients you'll probably see an increase in heart rate increase in respiratory rate most likely you're gonna see an increase in blood pressure that's just from that fluid overload um, and increase in entitled co2 because it's been building up for a while too you'll probably also see decreases in spo2 when you listen to them, you'll probably hear some wet or even wheezy lung sounds. And they'll be wheezy uh, without any kind of a history of COPD or asthma. And that is related to that second bullet point of the swelling. When you have all that extra fluid, it's backing up in the lungs, it's backing up into everywhere, including around the airways. So it's actually constricting their airways a little bit and causing a little bit of swelling. You can hear some wheezes on occasion. Not a telltale sign, but on occasion you may see it. This is uh, related to their fluid buildup, not necessarily airway constriction uh, like you would see in asthma or COPD. So is this patient in crisis? Absolutely. So again, lack of oxygen available to the cells. Uh, you get a rightward shift, which inhibits the uh, cells from um, picking up extra oxygen in the lungs. That's secondary to that buildup of lactic acid and carbon dioxide. So what's our treatment for this? We want to give them oxygen. If possible, CPAP is always a great choice, uh, especially with this. This will help give that extra pressure, push oxygen out of, or I'm sorry, push that fluid out of the way so the oxygen can get into the bloodstream and the carbon dioxide can get out. You may have to go down the route of supporting their ventilations with a BBM. And if you're doing that, chance are good, you'll have to put in a, an endotracheal tube if you have that available. If they're super hypertensive, uh, nitro can be helpful because that's going to open up the blood vessels, make more room for that excessive fluid until they can get it, until they can get it diuresed off, um, and that will eventually, and that'll help uh, release some of the pre extra pressure that the heart is working against. So, uh, Lasix for the most part is out of kind of favor for our CHF patients. They show that it's uh, causing some extra hypertension that we didn't want. Uh, that's about the extent of what I know about that. But uh, for the most part, we're, we're the literature showing that, that nitro is far more effective and producing better outcomes for our CHF patients, at least in the pre-hospital setting. So, all right, case number four. So case number four is a 31-year-old female found unconscious in her bedroom. She has a long history of polysubstance abuse and overdose. You find her with pinpoint pupils, agonal respiratory rate, and drug paraphernalia. So should we expect this patient to be in crisis? And what can we look at to tell us that? Well, with an opiate overdose, remember that you have uh, opiates that it get, are ingested into the body, whether it be... Um, you know, taken orally through like oxycontin pills or injected via heroin or fentanyl. And those opiates attach to receptors in the respiratory center of the brain. And that's gonna slow the rate and depth of spontaneous ventilation. With that, you're also gonna see decreased uh, Glasgow coma scale, decreased respiratory rate, uh, decre decreased SpO2. And initially you're gonna see uh, increased heart rate and blood pressure. 
Uh, in the late stages, though, when they're closer to cardiac arrest, you'll, pro you'll probably see no heart rate or blood pressure. So is this patient in crisis? Absolutely. So same, uh, same cause as before, just a little bit different of a, or same, same problem as before, just a little bit different of a cause. So lack of oxygen available to the cells, get that right where it shift, uh, prevents uptake of, of oxygen by the hemoglobin, and that's caused by that increase in lactic acid and, and carbon dioxide. So this lady is going down a very bad path and is what we like to call circling the drain. So our early treatment, especially for these patients, your, your priority always needs to be airway. Uh, open, suction, ventilate them with oxygen. Okay, that should be the, pre, pre, the, the treatment priority every time with an opiate overdose. Your next priority then, of course, is try and reverse the opiate, and you can do that via Narcan or Naloxone. Um, unfortunately, you also have to consider in these days uh, any kind of confounding drugs, such as benzodiazepines, amphetamines, alcohol, um, and this is what makes me emphasize that airway and oxygen should be a, a primary in opiate overdoses because we don't know what else could be on board with them. We may give some Narcan, it may take a little bit of it off, but it's not going to be enough to fully wake them up. So always support their airway and oxygen if we want the best possible outcome. So a quick summary of this, um, you know, early action is key. Um, when the problem is a systemic failure, uh, whether it be the urosepsis case that I showed or the opiate overdose, you have multiple things that are failing and tons and tons of cells throughout the body are in anaerobic metabolism. They're in a, a systemic failure. They're in crisis. Be sure to prioritize ventilation and oxygenation. Assess their status, recognize what the cause of the problem is, and act early. So provide ventilation, provide oxygenation as soon as you can to try and start reversing that process and keep them away from the uh, point of no return uh, by, by uh, reversing them out of crisis as soon as possible. Again, time is tissue. As we move more from left to right, our vital signs are uh, SpO2, the amount of blood we have, our cardiac output, all start to go down. The sooner we can get them out of crisis, the better. And that's illustrated by this graph. Um, as time goes on, we want to uh, prevent that rocket ship from taking off, or we want to uh, prevent Ralph Wiggum from rolling down the hill. So with that, I am open to any questions. I realize that this is a uh, video presentation, so it's a little tough to do that. Um, but if you'd like to ask me any questions, I'm, I'm happy to hear them. Uh, below is my email, gkeating at co.delaware.oh.us. I want to thank everybody for what you guys do out there. Uh, sitting behind a desk, it's a little bit uh, it, it's a little bit humbling given everything that's going on with this pandemic. 